believe we're back at quorum, but if we want to give uh, Councilman Lavelle another minute, maybe. Oh, there he is. Everyone's president accounted for. Um, so, yep, good. Calling the meeting back to order. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a non voting Lower Hill board briefing. Um, from the staff side, um, joining us, or I guess first we're going to do um, public comment. I apologize. Um, our first registered uh, speaker is uh, Shavesa Cheney. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Chavesha Cheney and I'm the Policy and Programs Associate at the Hill CDC. And I'm here to speak on the Lower Hill development status with the Hill District's Univac Community Review Process, the Development Review Panel. The Development Review Panel is a two-step process. The first step is a focused deep dive review and scoring at the committee level. If a plan is aligned with the master plan and or CSIP, the second step is to advance the plan to the community to review and vote. Each and every resident is allowed to vote. In January 2020, the Lower Hill development team submitted to the DRP. On February 5th, 2020, Block E completed, completed the first step of the DRP process and passed with an 89% B. However, they never completed the second step, advising the DRP that due to COVID and because they were urgently focused on improving Block G at the time, they were not ready to present and to be scored by the entire Hill District community. Thus, they never completed the, the process. More recently, the PPG and the PINs were invited to once again present to the DRP on July 6th of 2022 to provide an update to the development plans for Block E. The DRP deliberated on the development project and suggested the developer resubmit the DR to the DRP due to extensive changes to the Block E development. And in addition to an entire two year time frame elapsing since the complete, since they completed the first step of the DRP. In short, Buccini Poland Group and PAR have refused to resubmit to the development review panel, although they promised to honor the DRP process in the last testimony before the Sitting Planning Commission and the URA when they were trying to secure support for Block G1, which failed the DRP with a score below 60%. Not only has the Lower Hill Development Team not honored the DRP, they have worked to form another RCO group in hopes of securing a favorable score. This was an intentional intent to undermine our unified table and threatens the RCO ordinance goal of equity. While we support diverse voices and perspectives in the Hill District, it is unacceptable for a private developer to meddle with the city's endorsed process aimed at achieving equitable results. I hope you agree. As the staff person who stands the DRP process, I ask that you instruct Puccini Poland Group and the Pittsburgh Penguins to support equity by following through on their commitments to work within the community process versus harming our community further by sowing confusion and division. Thank you for your support and consideration. Thank you, Shaveja. Um, our next registered speaker is Maruma Malines. You'll have three minutes and your time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Maruma Malines, president <clears throat> and CEO of the Hill District. Community Development Corporation and member of the Lower Hill Executive Committee. Today I am speaking on behalf of the Hill CDC and the many Hill District residents who cannot be here to speak on their own behalf, most of whom are low income residents struggling to make ends meet, some working two jobs. As you know, the Hill CDC endorses equitable development anchored in comprehensive <coughs> excuse me, benefits for our neighborhood. In order to be equitable, we must center the needs of impacted communities and communication with stakeholders who live in those impacted communities. We must craft intentional development plans that solve community problems rather than ignore current issues or create new ones. My concern today is that the Lower Hill Block E plan, which is slated to be sold to the developer for only $10, fails to fulfill the commitments under the URA and Hill uh, under the URA uh, agreement for uh, dated October 18th, 
2019. That term sheet states that the developer shall fund the rehab of Ammon Recreation Center, including but not limited to the installation of a multi-purpose space for community celebrations and deck hockey refurbishment of playground and basketball courts and the development of rec to tech programming space for the benefit of Hill District residents and children and families uh, shall be done at, with and in partnership with uh, Macedonia Church of Pittsburgh and the city of Pittsburgh. The, the development team honored about $100,000 of that commitment. Uh, the amount that they initially committed uh, was supposed to be a value of uh, $1 million. So they have fallen short of that. They were also supposed to partner with Partner for Work to locate a first source hiring center uh, on or near the option uh, premises, which is the Lower Hill site. Uh, while a first source hiring center is open, the relationship with Partner for Work needs to be strengthened. And they certainly need to work on the hospitality jobs commitment, uh, which would absolutely be uh, related to this particular block, Block E, where uh, many, many people could get jobs at the entertainment venue, but we are behind on that training. It also says that they shall re, uh, fulfill the funding gaps uh, as of the date of the term sheet for the curtain call project and assist the seller with the design and installation of the curtain call. While they have assisted in relocating the curtain call and providing a new design, they have received no community input relative to the curtain calls um, new proposed location that is gonna be proposed by way of the preliminary land development plan. And more importantly, there is still a funding gap, uh, which is deeply concerning given uh, a number of factors. It also says that they shall um, uh, work and coordinate with the New Granada Theater on programming. And to clarify, that is not just entertainment and music, uh, quote unquote programming, but also the development program. That's very important to understand. It says that they shall capitalize 50% uh, of the LERDA payment up front. That is still a question mark as to whether or not they will do that. I would like uh, also to know today through the briefing whether or not Catapult will be directly on Wiley Avenue, not tucked behind another storefront, but right on Wiley Avenue where you can walk into uh, the Catapult and or uh, incubator storefront right off of Wiley versus going through another storefront. And then also I would love for the city to give an update on their commitment to construct a rescue two station and EMS station. <clears throat> Additionally, the commitments do not reserve, these commitments to the URA do not represent the fullness of the requirements as outlined in the CSIP. So not only has the developer failed to complete the community's most experienced and unified roundtable on community review in the Hill District, the DRP, they are also falling short on the actual community benefits agreement and continue to be overly reliant on diverted tax dollars, such as the parking tax diversion and LERDA. To put those investments, quote unquote investments into perspective, uh, which I'm sure they will be celebrated today. The developers, what, what they really mean is that the developers are not paying 50% of the taxes owed to the three taxing bodies due, um, due to the LERDA. And they are not paying 75% of the taxes owed to the city of Pittsburgh. And while we appreciate that the middle and upper Hill district will get 50% of the LERDA and 25% of the parking tax diversion, both, but the economics of those tax breaks should allow for the Pens and Buccini polling group to make good on their commitments to fund a private source of funding for the Hill district. Here are a few ways that that can be achieved. A formal and signed agreement regarding community jobs from, from Live Nation and other event operators, demonstration of minority ownership um, for Block E, which has been very unclear and is clearly outlined in the CSIP, a private revenue stream that could be funded by a $2 surcharge on each car parked and a $2 surcharge per ticket sold. Uh, those funds could be go directly into the fund at the house at the um, excuse me at the urban redevelopment authority right now in the greater hill district reinvestment fund uh, they could fully support the new granada which still needs some parking solutions which still needs operational uh, support from programming from a programming uh, standpoint and a broad um, array of other opportunities uh, the bottom line is that the hill district um, <clears throat> excuse me the hill district residents uh, and the hill district community deserves commensurate um, reinvestment uh, that the developers uh, can put into the Hill District instead of consistently pointing to tax diversions and only MBE success. So while we would like to ensure that our community is development, we must also ensure that there is shared prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marilla. Um, Daniel, I believe we had two written comments submitted as well. 
Yeah, I can go ahead and read those because they're pretty brief. Uh, the first is from Tyler Anthony on the Lower Hill Block E redevelopment. Quote, this looks awesome and I hope it comes to fruition. I also hope that with any new park, there's a fountain of some sort as that has been a staple of many of Pittsburgh's large parks, Allegheny Commons, Shenley, et cetera, end quote. This second and final written comment um, was received from Dylan Brown, uh, quote, lower or please enforce the community collaboration and implementation or CSIP uh, with respect to the development of this site and the Greater Hill District. That document already outlines everything in clear terms for the developers and should remain the basis for development. The proposed fee on tickets and parking will not deter the public's participation in this site's event. And I think is, is the easiest solution to develop a capital stream that Hill District residents can directly, or can, excuse me, can direct as they see fit. Thank you, Daniel. I believe we're gonna begin with a staff briefing and Julia McMahon, James Reed, and Hannah. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna, someone with a, with a difficult last name, I apologize, <laughs> I haven't mastered yours yet. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Hannah Swanovec. I am counsel to the URA. I am joined by Julia McMahon, you are a project manager for the Lower Hill development. Today, Julia and I will be providing the URA board and the public with a briefing on the takedown of Block E within the Lower Hill site. No formal board action will take place today. Today's briefing is on the Block E project. Actually, Daniel, I'm sorry, could you go back one slide? Thank you. On the right side of this slide is an image of the entire Lower Hill site. Block E, which is labeled, is approximately two and a half acres and proposed to contain a parking garage, entertainment venue, public safety facility, and commercial space. Block E is situated across Logan Avenue from FNB Tower, which is currently under construction on Block G1. Block E is owned by the URA's co-seller, the Sports and Exhibition Authority of Pittsburgh and Allegheny County, or the SEA and is being developed by the Pittsburgh Arena Real Estate Redevelopment LP, also known as PAR, and the Buccini Poland Group, BPG. In order for the co-sellers and development team to close on the Block E project, the URA and SE board, SEA boards must give their final approval of the project. Prior to considering any votes on the Lower Hill project, the URA board has committed to briefing the public on voting items. Today's presentation is to inform the board and the public about the status of Block E, in preparation for final approval of the same by this board. So to reiterate, no formal board action will occur today. Next slide, Daniel. On October 18, 2019, the URA had a special board meeting where the Lower Hill Blocky project was presented publicly. At that meeting, the URA board preliminarily approved the Lower Hill Developer LLC as the Blocky redeveloper. The URA board also provided preliminary approval of the conceptual development plan for Blocky. The presentation of a parking tax diversion was approved, as well as the execution of documents to implement the PTD. Since preliminary approval of the conceptual development plan of Block E in October of 2019, the designs for the project have evolved. Julia will now provide an overview of the changes to the design of Block E. Hello, as Hannah said, my name is Julia McMahon and I am a project manager in the Development Services Unit. Um, Daniel, can you go to the this is the right slide. Uh, this slide shows a comparison of the project in 2019 and 2022. Seven changes, several changes have occurred, including the removal of the subterranean parking garage and the outdoor amphitheater. The 2022 entertainment venue is smaller than the design in 2019, which accounts for the removal of the outdoor venue space. The parking garage is slightly larger than in 2019, though there is less retail space overall. Next slide, please. This slide shows the 2019 design. As you can see, it includes the subterranean parking garage on the left with the outdoor amphitheater located on top. On the right is the entertainment venue and retail space. I'm just gonna give everyone a second to look at this. All right, moving on, please. 
this slide is the updated 2022 design. This slide shows the view of Block E from Logan Street and Wiley Avenue. The parking garage is on the left on Logan Street. The lobby of the entertainment venue is located at the intersection of the two streets. The Block E entertainment venue will be leased and operated by Live Nation. The URA retail incubator, which we will discuss later, is located on Wiley to the right of the lobby. This slide shows the view of the parking garage from Bedford Avenue and Logan Street. The text on the parking garage is a Claude McKay reference to the Hill District as a crossroads of the world. Per the term sheet for blocks B and E, entered into by FAR, the SEA, the URA on October 18, 2019, a public safety facility is included in the Block E project. It is to be located at the upper corner of Bedford Avenue with entrances located on Fulberton. This slide shows images of Hill District musicians at the corner of Wiley and Fullerton. The space between the photos are designed to look like piano keys. It's also worth noting that Fullerton Street is to be converted into a one-way street, starting at Wiley Avenue, moving towards Bedford. Now, Hannah will discuss the approval process for the takedown of this block. Thanks, Julia. The comprehensive amended and restated option agreement between the URA the SEA and PAR governs the development of the Lower Hill site. The development team has completed the first five steps of the approval process for the takedown of Block E. They have secured preliminary board approval for the design and redevelopment of Block E, which is step seven. The development team is currently in the pre-final board approval board prep, uh, period, excuse me, which is step nine, as well as completing step six, the submission of takedown materials. Several items needed for the takedown of Block E are outstanding, and the URA and SEA have been in communication with the development team about these matters, who continue to submit updated materials for our review. We will now provide an update on option uh, agreement items, some of which are outstanding. The items we will review in detail are the community review of Block E, financials for the Block E project, the Block E final, final land development plan, or FLDP, the minority owned and women owned business enterprise plan and workforce plan for Block E, as well as urban open space. The development team has participated in several community meetings to introduce the Block E project. On October 3rd, the development team was part of a neighborhood level review of Block E and the, per excuse me, the proposed amendment to the preliminary land development plan or PLDP for the Lower Hill site. This meeting was co-hosted by the Hill District Consensus Group and the Hill District Collaborative. Meeting attendees submitted scorecards, which resulted in a C plus grade for both the PLDP amendment and the Block E project. On the slide are the scorecard results for the Block E project only. As a result of public's feedback at that meeting, the Hill District Consensus Group submitted a letter of support for the Block E project. On October 17th, the development team presented the Block E project to the community in a development activities meeting hosted by the City of Pittsburgh Planning Commission. The community was given the opportunity to ask questions to the development team and provide commentary on the Block E design and the Lower Hill development broadly. In accordance with the option agreement, the development team has submitted letters of community review. In total, six letters of support for Block E have been provided from the community. Two of the six letters provided are from Hill District-based entities, and as previously stated, one such letter came from the Hill District Consensus Group, and the other came from Cameron Real Estate Services. The development team has disengaged with the Development Review Panel, or DRP, for Block E, but continues to engage with the DRP on the PLDP amendment. Julia will now discuss financials for Block E. Thank you, Hannah. As part of its routine due diligence process, URA staff requested specific financial information from the development team that would allow URA staff to complete its financial review for the Block E project. The development team responded by providing the majority of what was requested. However, key information is outstanding. URA staff is unable to finalize its review without this information. URA staff has followed up with, develop with the development team concerning the outstanding materials. Discuss the final land development plan. The development team participated in a meeting with the Contextual Design Advisory Panel, or CDAP, in October of this year. Feedback from the CDAP was overall positive, though there were some suggestions. 
including the horizontal terracotta application on the parking garage versus the vertical application on the entertainment venue, the conflict between the parking garage entrance and the pedestrian traffic, CDAP suggested in the exploration of pedestrian first design elements, and finally, the graphic, graphic representation of words on the parking garage. The Depart uh, Department of City Planning briefing in final hearing has not been scheduled for Block E for the PLDP amendment. Next slide, please. Um, MWBE, the development team received approval from the City of Pittsburgh Equal Opportunity Review Commission on June 16th, 2022 for its preliminary, preliminary Block E MWBE plan. The commission approved plan lists goals of 30% minority owned and 15% women owned business participation. Per the city's diversity business man manager, the development team will report back to the commission and provide updates as the plan progresses. Uh, workforce development plan. Next slide, please, Daniel. Oh, no, one to go back one. Um, the option agreement states the development team is to demonstrate a good faith effort to reach the city's workforce of 25 gold minority and 10% women participation. The development team has committed to maximizing local and minority workforce inclusion on this project. Because the development team has not selected a contractor, it's difficult for the development team to provide, provide meaningful updates on the preliminary MWBE and workforce plans at this time. Anna is now going to discuss urban open space. Thank you. Block E does not contain urban open space, but like all developed parcels at the Lower Hill site, Block E will trigger the creation of a particular amount of urban open space. This acreage requirement will be met uh, by the development of Block F2. At present, the URA and SEA are exploring what adequate security may be needed to ensure the quality development of Block F2 as urban open space. Next slide, please, Daniel. Thank you. The 2019 term sheet states that the development team is obligated to fulfill several community benefits with the takedown of Block E, Block B, and with the development of the site. The Block E benefits are a rescue station and URA retail incubator space within Block E, coordination between the venue operator and New Granada Theater, and delivery of a parking tax diversion. The other term sheet obligations are capitalization of the LERDA, bridging the funding gap for curtain call, upgrades to the Ammon Recreation Center, and delivery of a first source center in the Lower Hill. We will now go through these items one by one, starting with the rescue station. The development team has committed to the delivery of a turnkey rescue station for the city of Pittsburgh. It is to be approximately 2,500 square feet with at least three bays for rescue vehicles. The term sheet does not list the costs associated with the construction of the public safety facility. The development team is responsible for delivery of the space as described in the term sheet. The development team continues to have discussions with the city of Pittsburgh to determine the details of the blocky rescue station. The development team will similarly deliver a retail incubator space to be leased to the URA. The URA retail incubator space will be located on the ground floor of Wiley Avenue. URA staff have shared program details with the development team concerning our proposed use of the incubator space. The development team is responsible for ensuring that the entertainment venue operator coordinates its programming with the new Granada Theater. In furtherance of this deliverable, at least one meeting has occurred between Live Nation and New Granada. Julie, at this time, can you please walk us through the remaining term sheet items? Thank you. We're going to talk about the LERDA. The development team is required to capitalize 50% of the owner payment of the Local Economic Revitalization Tax Assistance, or LERDA, for the benefit of the Greater Hill District Neighborhood Reinvestment Fund. The development team is seeking updated term sheets from several banks for the monetization of the LERDA for the reinvestment fund. The development team is similarly seeking term sheets from several banks for the monetization of the Greater Hill District Affordable Housing Fund from, for the, from the Block E Parking Tax Diversion, or PTD. No updated term sheets are available at this time for the LERDA or the Parking Tax Diversion Funds. Curtain call. The development team is required to fill the funding gap for the curtain call art installation tentatively to be located on portions of block A and B on, of the Lower Hill site. The development team has stated that both public and private funds have been secured for the curtain call. Moving on to Ammon. 
the development team has made $100,000 worth of improvements to the Ammon Community Recreation Center's Rec to Tech program. The term sheet requires the development team to deliver additional items related to Ammon, such as the installation of a multi-purpose space for community celebrations and deck hockey, and the refurbishment of a playground and basketball court. The development team is waiting for a list of priority items from the city of Pittsburgh to move forward with their next Ammon investment. And finally, the development team has opened a first source center on Center F. Next slide. This is the end of the URA staff briefing of the Lower Hill Block E. Thank you for listening. The development team will now provide a brief presentation to the board and public. Okay, Bomani, should I get started? Let's go. All right, let's go. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Buccini. I'm co-president of the Buccini Poland Group, and I am here with other members of the, um, uh, the Buccini Poland Group, including Bomani Howells and Dr. Kimberly Ellis, and Craig, I'm pretty sure Craig from far is on as well. Um, forgive me if I'm missing other members of Puccini Poland, but um, we're very uh, appreciative of our hosts for, um, for having us here uh, this afternoon, both the board and the staff of the URA. Um, you know, you all really helped us get launched on Block G in the FMB Tower, which we are, you know, fast underway on construction um, and for all the support uh, in the efforts to get the development going. Um, we're very encouraged by, um, by both um, the FMB Tower um, as well as the parking garage and Live Nation, as we've really survived uh, the very worst of a global pandemic. And, um, you know, we're incredibly optimistic about um, the, the impact we're having on uh, the historic uh, Hill District. It's really exciting. Um, you know, Block E, which we're speaking about today, uh, was first introduced to the URA and the SCA and community stakeholders as early as 2019. And you know we really had to get the tower going, um, and um, but before we could, you know, then the next phase being the Live Nation in the parking garage. Um, as I said, the Block E is the next phase of the entire Lower Hill development. We've got more uh, parcels uh, quickly coming, but this is the the next phase of um, of, of the Lower Hill. Um, we are. Uh, there have been incredible, uh, I don't have to explain to anyone on this, on this call, uh, we live it, we feel it every day. There have been incredible headwinds um, of rising costs, both construction and due to supply chain, labor, but also just interest rates that have, that have you know, nearly doubled. Um, and, and you know, th this is a phased project, which really makes it different than probably most projects that you know, any of us work on, because the, each project builds um, on, on top of, of itself. So, um, you know, many of the, the reinvestment that we're doing here uh, in the Lower Hill um, is, is sort of building on each other. So for instance, you know, the minority women-owned businesses that are, that are building the Lower Hill, that seems to just be getting better and better and better as we really figure out how best to, um, to do something that's probably never been done in Pittsburgh and, you know, certainly must have much of America before. Um, and this is also probably the least exciting phase of it as we talk about infrastructure like parking garages, but you know, parking garages are, um, it's, it's vital to the rest of the 28 acre parcel. So, um, you know, here we go on that. Um, I, if we could just go to the, set, the, the second slide, please. Um, you know, to be very clear, the, uh, the block G1, you can see there in blue, and we're talking about all of block E, we're taking all of it down at once. Um, so the right side of it is where the Live Nation would be and the incubator space would be. And the left side of it will, is where, um, and that's along Wiley Avenue, obviously. And then the left side of it is where the parking garage uh, will be as well. What this doesn't show is just to the right of the Block G1 tower, you know, about half of that open space um, is also being developed as well. So that's, you know, between Washington and Logan and, and just to the right of, of the tower. We're really excited about that, that space as well. And I, and I do see Craig Dunham, so I apologize, Craig. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, co community building uh, is, is, is part of the, the DNA of the Puccini Poland Group in our, our nearly 30 year history. It's something that we're extremely proud of and, and we're really incredibly proud of the work 
that we've been able to do here in Pittsburgh and in the low in the, in the entire histo uh, historic Hill District. Um, and, and really all the people whose lives we've already in just you know a year into this you know decade long project uh, that, that we've already that we've already affected. Um, I, you know, we, we hope you find that our, that our efforts are sincere, uh, that our commitment is firm, and the results and the impacts of what we are doing here are, are very considerable and having meaningful impact on the, um, the Upper Hill community. Uh, we, we remain on track to do what we said we would do. We're very proud to be delivering on what we said we, were, we, 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 we would do. And um, along the way, we're during a pretty tough economic climate we are providing a very large economic toll to this community. Um, and all while doing it with uh, very creative and inclusive um, uh, development, something that just doesn't get done much in America. So, and I think at the end of the day, we are delivering a project that everyone in Pittsburgh and certainly at the Buccini Poland and the Penguins and FNB Bank, um, who are all spending you know, countless hours on this project, something that all of us will be proud of. And with that, I'd like to hand it over uh, to my partner, Bomani Howes and Dr. Kimberly Ellis, um, who really are, are living and breathing, breathing this day to day. Thanks guys, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Chris. I wanna start with this page so that as we proceed through the presentation, it, is the, it, it comes very clear that our obligations to fulfilling the seven focus areas of the CSIP are met. You've seen these, but I want to pay, I want to just put this out here so that it is a reminder of what our framework is. And so first area is minority women, business, enterprise, and inclusion. We'll touch on that. Job creation, local inclusion, and workforce is our second area of focus. Inclusionary and home ownership housing programs, home ownership and housing programs, focus area number three. Four is communications, reporting, and tracking. Wealth building initiatives, number five. Six is cultural and community legacy initiatives. And then the last is coordinated community development strategies. This is our framework that we go to work with every day in and out. Next slide, please. So on the MWBE participation, the framework that we've developed is an innovative one. It's gritty, it's getting up early in the morning and staying late at night to contact contractors to make sure that their needs, their capacity building needs, back of office needs are being met so that they can have the potential to perform and participate on site. And so in the first project, the FMB Financial Center, we've been able to uh, achieve impressive results with regard to the heart and core of this construction project. To date of the $102 million spend, we've surpassed the, the goals that we set with $35 million in awards to MWBEs. And of that, we created a special column in our reporting, which is one of our CSIP obligations, a special column to focus on those who have been hit by the most harm, and that is African-American contractors. We make sure that we report this out to the EMC on a monthly basis, to the URA and the SEA as well. And to date, we have $24 million to Black-owned companies. And we should all be celebrating in that and not minimizing those achievements. Just today, we received notice that uh, we have a prime that can serve as an example of the awardees that can start off as small companies, but then grow and graduate to being uh, larger primes that don't have to sit behind other companies to prop them up. And so we're very proud to, uh, to announce today, Butler Landscaping received a huge package and is one of our first primed African-American owned businesses that is an actually self-performing prime. On the pre-development spend for Block E, of the $1.65 million, one million of that has gone, has been awarded to, this is pre-development architectural and MEP contracting. Of that 1.65 million, we have $1 million 
allocated to MWBEs and of that 240K to African-American owned firms. And so this is the type of work that we're doing to build small and large companies alike. Next slide, please. This is just one example of the, the capacity building stories. This is a guy, Wade Lipscomb of Triple Three, who is a part of a team that has a $7.4 million package. Wade is just a small company, a two person company who needed assistance in the lift from a larger company to be able to participate. And just to show you how we collaborate with our partners at F&B, uh, at First Financial Bank, they provided $2 million to be housed at the URA for small contractors like Wade to be able to access a small business line of credit so that they can handle the union dues, the um, union membership, to be able to, for, to put monies towards purchasing, to stretch out over time for payment of their, of their workers. And so this is just an example of the type of uh, capacity building back of office assistance that we're providing for small companies. Next slide, please. I wanna turn this over to Dr. Ellis, who's been working very hard in, in one of our other commitments to deliver a first source hiring center, Dr. Ellis. Thank you so much, Bamani. Uh, as we continue on with our CSIP areas, <clears throat> we have a focus on job creation and workforce development. We opened the First Source Center in June of 2021 with a main partnership, working partnership with PA CareerLink uh, specifically. And we have three main partnerships with trainings largely in the construction trades. Uh, the A. Philip Randolph Institute with jobs that include in energy and manufacturing with the Builders Guild Introduction to the Construction Trades and CARP, uh, the Carpentry Apprentice Readiness Program. In addition, we have a number of different trainings, but one in particular is BankWorks, uh, which is a bank uh, working program. And we actually have graduates presently working at FNB uh, Bank. And we have much, much more in terms of supporting small businesses like Fat Girls or Cooking. Next slide. We held a job trade in 2022 with over 200 registrants. And we also have a street team that attends community events and promotes the First Source Center in a variety of different creative ways. Next slide. We also have a strong partnership with the Pittsburgh Public Schools Career and Technical Education Program for which we won an industry award. And this program has now been adopted by the entire city of Pittsburgh. Um, we're very proud to be a part of this program. Next slide. The community legacy initiatives, <clears throat> oh, sorry, this, this is still um, uh, our partnership, but this is our industry award and all the participants. This was our career exploration day. Thanks, next slide. The community legacy initiatives is another CSIP focus area. And this is a sample of what will appear on block E. As you see, the design of the building is as piano keys at Wiley and Fullerton, which celebrates the rich jazz history of this exact site on this exact street. <clears throat> it also includes 20 foot tall pictures, such as celebrating people such as Mary Lou Williams, who you see in the middle there, uh, who was an international pianist from the Historic Hill District. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Uh, we continue our work of recruiting artists to work on initially Block G1 and plan to extend that to the storefront and the lobby of Block E Garage. This is just an example of our artist engagement. Next slide. Finally, under the CSIP area of community reporting and tracking, we report all of our work to the executive management committee every single month. These are all the members of the EMC and they, they know exactly what we're doing every single month. Thank you so much. I will now hand this over back to Bomani House. So one of the values that we have is for a collective wide approach towards making sure that we are hearing all voices from the Hill. And so we wanna go back to a timeline that, that begins in 2019 and, and travels all the way up to 2022. And so I wanna be very clear about why we reach out to all 
Hildas groups and not just one. It has been, we've been criticized for the overwhelming focus on one group and not the multiple that reflects the diversity of the hill. And I, I want to, to address the claim that the Lower Hill Group, uh, the Lower Hill Development Team propped up, a, propped up an organization to counter the Hill CDC. Absolutely baseless. We have not done that. Let that record be clear. The Hill District Collaborative that we've reached out to, the Hill Consensus Group, these groups represent members of the Hill District that have been involved in the, Hill, in the Lower Hill Development for decades. Some are new to the party, most are not. And to act as if they don't belong at the table is quite offensive to some. And so we want to reach out and, and reach across the aisle and work with all of our Hill District uh, groups, the Hill District Collaborative, the Hill Consensus Group, the Shinley Heights Collaborative, Uptown Partners, and absolutely most uh, as uh, the, the Hill CDC that has been championing this work for um, a very long time since the very beginning. We're working with all groups. Next slide. So here is an example of the scoring system that the Hill District Collaborative put forth to the community. The difference here in the way that they measure is that they allow the development team to go before the community and they actually allow community members to vote. They don't have an isolated group to determine when the community can hear from the development team. And so we went before this team October 3rd, community groups spoke out, and then separately their board followed up with a separate meeting to vote independently of what the community group um, scored us at. And so I thought it was fair. We didn't get the best score, but we passed both in the DRP with an 89 score, and then we passed with the Hill Collaborative and with the Hill Consensus Group. We passed with all three community groups. Next slide. <clears throat> I'll pick uh, it up here. Um, this is Craig Dunham, and it's a, a pleasure to be with all of you again. It's probably been a year or so, and um, as, as many of you know, I was supporting the project uh, as a consultant for about 10 years, and just in the last two months of joined the Penguins as an employee, and, and I'm really focused now full-time on, on this project, as well as a few other endeavors that the Penguins have going on in the region. Um, I, again, I wanted to provide some context. Um, as Chris mentioned, you know, a lot has happened since 2019 when the term sheet was executed. Back then, the prime weight was four and three quarters. Today, it's seven percent. Back then, inflation was 1.8 percent. This year, it's it's trending at four and four and three quarters percent. Office utilization, retail demand, uh, is is very very different and difficult to project. Parking garage utilization, as as the URA probably knows, because they they own some with their partners, the parking authority, is also uh, a very dynamic uh, market and difficult to to trend at this point. Um, the term tree uh, in 2019 was really organized in three areas. There are uh, seller obligations, block E specific obligations, <clears throat> and then additional obligations of the option E, and the option E in this case is, is, is PAR. Um, I kind of wanted to summarize quickly where we're at with all of these. Um, the seller had several obligations. Um, the LERDA guidelines were amended. Um, and then uh, we were able to fund the, the first LERTA uh, tranche coming out of G1. Additionally, um, the shift in responsibility for uh, infrastructure uh, went to the option E. There's clarity around that. Um, we have since then made effort to uh, find uh, state and federal funds, and we continue to look back to our local partners uh, for, for letters of support in our efforts. 
we have a, a package right now that's that's advancing for review for some additional improvements on Washington Place that that bridge and help complete the work of of the very important Frankie May Pace Park and are in alignment with the Center Avenue improvements. Uh, we've got private match on that, and we're very much looking for local support to continue that endeavor. So Lerda established, uh, our, our efforts continue to advance the completion of uh, infrastructure on the park, on the project, uh, with the support of the seller. The second um, seller obligation, is, as uh, Hannah and Julia outlined, was the formation of a parking tax diversion. Uh, that was established shortly after the option agreement. The original idea at the time was that it would be uh, cover the entirety of the option premises, the 28 acres, um, and that would have included the first structured parking on the site, which is the G1 tower of about 110 spaces. It only got established for the um, garage E specific um, space. So there is a little bit of a, a loss in, in um, proceeds resulting from that. And we're hopeful that uh, if we come back with additional structured parking, uh, we hope we don't, but if we do come back, um, the opportunity to expand the, the tool of the parking tax diversion will be reconsidered. Um, there was uh, a, a, an arrangement around um, obligations to build garages, and if not waived, um, uh, funding would be identified, and the seller identified $3 million in RCAP. We're working through finalizing the grant agreements and the reimbursement process on that in tandem with some separate funds that were secured by PAR for the project. Next slide. Um, so the op option E, and in this case, these are block E specific, has obligations. We've, we've, we've touched on these previously. Um, the creation of a public safety building. Um, uh, at the time, that was that was estimated at about a million two uh, as an investment, um, about 4,000 square feet with two bays. Um, it's expanded to be about 5,300 square feet um, and includes three bays. We've been collaborating very closely with the folks at Public Works and uh, Emergency Medical Services to make sure the, the layout the scope is clear. Um, we, we've acknowledged that there's a significant funding gap. Um, the latest estimates that we have are about three and a half million dollars. Uh, we've reached out uh, through the GEDTF uh, program to see if we can find about a half a million dollars in funding that could help uh, close that gap and would certainly work on additional initiatives that may be available to, to support this uh, public facility. Uh, but the work continues, uh, the programs are being advanced, it's still very much an element of the project. Um, we've touched on the 1,200 square foot incubator. It is facing Wiley, it is 1,200 feet, it has exclusive storefront, it isn't behind another uh, space as was pointed out earlier. We did get some guidance uh, in October about the URA, from the URA uh, about some general components and, and outline requirements and a timeline for that. And we're incorporating those into our design as, as we move through construction documents. Uh, our development partner, BPG, will be circulating a lease proposal to URA uh, to capture the terms that need to be specifically resolved uh, for this facility. Uh, but, but the commitment remains and the location is clearly on Wiley. Um, another important element um, of the term sheet was this uh, discussion around our music venue operator, Live Nation, coordinating with the uh, New Granada Theater on programming. Uh, we had interpreted that to be programming events. Uh, I heard earlier today that meant programming in support of the development. Um, as we all probably know, Live Nation as an industry, the live music industry basically collapsed during COVID. Uh, when they came back this year, uh, we revisited the scope of the project, elected to take the outdoor amphitheater component out. Um, that had a lot to do with some sound studies that we performed uh, and a reevaluation of the market. Um, once we settled on that scope, got things retooled, um, the Penguins facilitated a couple of conversations between a regional manager and uh, Marimba Malliance and her team at the New Granada Theater. They exchanged uh, drawings and programs and projections. 
And those are being evaluated by Live Nation um, to, to get a sense of, of what they can support and, and provide some feedback as an operator of a facility. It's clear that uh, Live Nation is prepared to support booking some events at the venue, um, how many and what type will get worked out, but, but they've embraced that concept uh, and the importance of that as an extension of the commitment to programming. Um, we did get uh, uh, some additional ideas presented um, on behalf of the New Granada Theater related operations, tax credit guarantees, capital campaign support, parking and operations. In addition to the programming discussions, We've been evaluating those. We have not responded in total to them. Uh, and then more recently, uh, we did get uh, some requests to discuss and explore ticket surcharges, uh, which we're also exploring. Uh, we don't have a final commitment or statement about those, but those are uh, relatively recent requests to consider as part of the uh, venue operations. Next slide, please. Um, We've talked a lot about offsite LERDA. It has been delivered as the part of the first phase of the development from the G1 uh, project. We've been evaluating uh, the estimates for payout over 10 year, the sort of gross yield, and are now uh, BPG's finance team is in discussions with some local lenders and their community lending groups, FNB citizens actively in, in discussions. And now we've also reached out to Bridgeway Capitals uh, team to see um, what their thoughts are in monetization and what the yields would be. Um, we'll, we've shared over the course of a number of meetings with the SEA, the URA, CSIP, EMC, and I think we've also presented them in community meetings, uh, our assessment of uh, gross yield on the, uh, the LERDA. Um, Ammon, I think that people have acknowledged that an initial investment was made and it was opened in 21. It's been successful. Uh, the Penguins have continued to engage with city leadership, Councilman Lavelle, uh, Public Works Director, to identify what the next uh, priority projects are. Uh, we stand ready uh, to invest and advance those and make them happen, supportive of the, of, of the facility. Um, we have also understand that there's some um, uh, requests, relationship with Macedonia Church. Um, we don't know whether we're a direct participant in those discussions. We'll take the lead um, from the city on, on what Macedonia's church is. But again, we stand ready to, to make additional in investments as we committed in the term sheet. Um, we've already touched on the, the first source center that has been located. It's been opened. It was built. It's resourced by a, a local consultant. The BPG team has direct employees that are available there, and uh, we have a whole plethora of partners from the unions and various uh, public service uh, and social service organizations, which, which we've highlighted earlier. Um, so curtain call. Um, in 2019, the estimate for the project located next to console was about a million eight. And there were uh, roughly a million dollars in funds identified for that. Uh, 500,000 of that was recently um, committed by the regional asset districts. Um, in 20, uh, I think 2021, two of the foundations pulled their funding of about $400,000. Um, and then we began to evaluate uh, with, with the engagement of Walter Hood, the artist, and if those of you recall um, some of our visions for um, some modifications to the master plan, how the artwork could move from console or PPG arena, original location to be placed in this urban open space network that really begins with the Frankie Mae Pace Park and we were envisioning running all the way up to Crawford Street. Uh, Walter got very excited about the idea um, we, we looked at the locations that were available and identified a location up at the uh, corner of Crawford and uh, Wiley. Um, since that time, a team was assembled, um, design work was advanced, we got uh, estimates. The total project is now in excess of $6 million. The artwork component is about $2.3 We've been able to identify about a million dollars in funding uh, from various sources. Heinz Endowments is back in 
to uh, committing to the project. The regional asset district remains committed to the project. And we've found a path for the remaining 800,000 of investment from our private sources uh, necessary to complete the artwork, as well as the site work um, component of the project is supported with some public funds from the state um, that were identified and the remainder being the uh, private component. We're drafting a letter of intent. I'll outline the whole framework of, of cost evolution and sources in that uh, that will follow with a takedown notice and the final land development process. It is important to get the uh, preliminary land development plan that we've proposed to be amended to relocate the open space, um, and then and then we would advance the uh, you know the the public process for for the artwork being placed on this space. Um, that's essentially, I think, a recap of the term sheet components. We did um, next slide, please. Provide um, information that we've shared to a number of venues about our uh, estimates for Lerta projections for the garage, um, <clears throat> annualized at 800,000, 50% of that would go to the reinvestment fund on an annual basis. The 10 year aggregate is about 8 million, therefore 50% is 4 million. This is the projection that we're now working with lenders to see um, what, what they're able to capitalize on and what the yield would be. Uh, we we expect it to be substantially less than than four million. Next slide. Um, and then this is a slide that we've shared in a couple of in a number of venues. This is our estimate of parking tax diversions, uh, and the and the revenues that would be directed to the Hill District Affordable Housing Initiatives in years one through twenty. Um, <clears throat> it looks like it's about a nine point eight million dollar projection. As you can imagine, uh, estimating parking parking revenues uh, is is uh, highly highly variable, uh, but this is consistent with our projections for the overall garage operations. And so, similarly, we've taken this information out to market, and we'll see uh, we'll see if there's a, uh, a facility that can be identified to capitalize it, or whether or not it makes sense to just let this uh, like Alerta play out on an annual basis. So this is where we're at on the Lerta and parking projections specific to Block E. Craig, before before you move on, can you go back to the the Lerta projections? Those were up for for just a short amount of time. Sure. Can you walk us in the public through that again, please? Sure. So we're using an underlying construction value at this point of seventy six million, an assessed value of thirty five million, uh, the millage rate of 2.3 we know that there are some caps uh on 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 the amount that can be abated at two hundred fifty thousand dollars um that translates into a total annual real estate of eight hundred three thousand dollars and this is based on two parcels um and so fifty percent of that is four hundred thousand and not capitalized the total is eight million over ten years And I think we've, we've shared these more granularly with uh, James and Julia and, and the team at uh, the URA. These are summary summary numbers. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so if you could go forward two slides, please. Um, just two seconds on for the for the benefit of the board. Uh, one slide up, please. Uh, we do have a process underway amending the preliminary land development plan. It was established in 2014. The primary drivers of this are to reflect the, what has occurred, uh, which is essentially the construction of streets, the completion of Frankie Mae Pace Park and the subdivision of, of the Block G. Uh, we are proposing to not construct any more streets on A, B, and C blocks, and not to finish the portion of Lower Wiley between Logan and Washington Place. Uh, when, we, when we 
turn that into a new plan on the right. The one on the left is the original PLDP. The one on the right is our proposed PLDP. Uh, you get a reconfiguration of blocks A, B, C, F, and G. We're proposing to reorganize the open space. We've shared some vision plans and images that describe a continuity of open space running from Frankie May Pace up Park up to Crawford Street. This reorganization would allow us to realize that. It would also allow us to, to reconfigure what we're proposing to do on our block A and B for residential development. And it would also um, allow us to advance the proposed open space that's related to the block E um, uh, that's intended to be placed on block F2. Um, so the, there's a whole series of things that come together in this uh, preliminary land development plan that are directly related to how we would like to be advancing the project in the coming year uh, with the current takedowns and some planned takedown efforts. Next slide. Um, just a similar diagram. This is, this is more about the streets, the reorganization of the streets, the connection and reorganization of pedestrian pathways. I think the one on the right is a little bit old. We've we've clarified the creation of some easements across blocks. Um, that that clarification was provided to planning last Friday, um, and we're hopeful that this can move forward uh, and and become the basis of of the plan that we work for with collectively uh, as as option E as seller and 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 community. Um, so last slide. Um, Thank you all very much for your time. Uh, we remain incredibly excited about this project and all the opportunities that it presents uh, for the region, the community. Uh, we're delighted with our partner BPG and their full embrace on the initiatives uh, that this project entails and engages and the outcomes that it can, that it can result in. Uh, and we remain committed to collaboration with the community and with our public partners in order to advance this. And um, we look forward to coming back for final approval in short order. Uh, I you. want to acknowledge our uh, newest member of our team uh, that wasn't announced in the beginning, Jessica Jeffries. Welcome to the team. Uh, she is our new development project coordinator. Thank you uh, for your time. Uh, thank you all. Um, obviously, there's a lot there. Um, I, I, I guess for board members, um, as we're digesting it, um, if there's any immediate questions, I know we have some in the, the Q&A portal, but um, we'll open the floor. Uh, I'll go. Uh, go, go for it. Thanks. Um, so I have a, I guess, first, a, just sort of a general statement and then a question and follow up to, to that. But um, there are clearly some inconsistencies, I guess, uh, maybe the uh, kindest way to phrase it, between some of the public comment we've, we've heard today and throughout this process uh, and, and frankly, even some of what has been relayed to URA staff and some of what you all just presented to us in, you know, in, in pretty good detail relating to the, uh, you know, follow through on commitments made as part of the 2019 term sheet. In other words, on, on multiple fronts, it feels like you guys have said and maintain that you've fulfilled all your commitments or are on track to fulfilling all your commitments, uh, you know, and uh, or otherwise in public comment, and, and that seems not to be 100% clear even from um, you know information that that URA staff have uh, whether it's in you know uh, ensuring that there actually are training programs in place that are directly connected to contractors and jobs uh, or uh, you know following through with AMIN or uh, you know taking necessary steps to ensure that there's coordination with New Granada theater on programming one after another so I don't think I, the, you know, this might not be the forum to litigate <laughs> all of each of those areas, but you all should expect the board over the course of the next month or more to dig into every single one of them in great detail. Um, you know, because we had a long and extensive process in 2019 that resulted in clear commitments being made. 
And it, it's 100% our intention to ensure that every single one of those commitments is is realized, uh, you know, uh, to the to the fullest extent uh, possible. And so that's my statement. <laughs> my, my question is uh, related to that in a way because I think that you know uh, probably the best predictor of current or future behavior is uh, you know is how we've done in the past. And um, I'm wondering whether you can provide to us, not at this moment, but can provide to us uh, some reporting on, on how we've done with respect to jobs placement on the FND project. Like one of the most sort of fundamental commitments made was to ensure that there's pre-apprenticeship training and first source outreach to make sure that Hill District residents had access to the construction jobs uh at FMB and then the same commitment exists for 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 this parcel um you know and not just to those jobs but to you know the careers that come after them in, in the building trades um yeah and I haven't seen uh any data reporting on kind of how that has gone so far on FMB and that would be extremely helpful Hey, Bomani, do you, I mean, it just I think one, I think one challenge of this project is, um, despite the efforts of our twenty-person team to get uh, the, the 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 facts out, the truth out, it's so hard to do, and it's frustrating because we have so many people. I mean, Bomani's like wiping his his, his eyes. Uh, we're doing something that just forget Pittsburgh or the state of Pen Delaware or state of Pennsylvania, but in America. Just doesn't get done. I mean, our our our, our target was supposed to be thirty percent for MWEs, and we're at thirty two or thirty three percent. We've got I think twenty two percent to black owned businesses alone. I mean, we we love to put. We have an eight an eight minute video we love to put on to show not like I I, I and I always hate talking about numbers, but you have to because that's what's been asked of us. But like, let's talk about the lives that we're changing and the people that we're touching, and. Um, it's so incredibly hard to do it. You know, it's like I, I always, I always just point to the eastern half of the United uh, of Pennsylvania. You know, the most aggressive targets we see on projects of this size are sort of fifteen percent. Um, I'm, you know, uh, work done by minority and women-owned businesses, so we're, we're, we're more than double that, and um, it requires a lot of a lot of work. And and um, you know, we we appreciate the question because we love to talk about it. And we, we you know, I think we should do Mamani's maybe even follow up with the. The, uh, the video that shows how we're actually affecting Hill District, um, uh, um, sorry, residents and people that grew up there. But I mean, Bomani, do you want to talk maybe a little bit about the uh, resource center? Chris, just to be clear, that was because that was your question. I just answered that because that was your first. That was your question. I apologize. Yeah, I mean, to be and to be clear, like the, the contracting is obviously really important, but I, I'm directly asking about job placement. You know, there was a, you know. The commitment made, and I think a lot of effort went into uh, to developing a, you know, what everybody I think acknowledges is a great first short center in the hill. And then there was a subsequent commitment made to, you know, partnering with uh, Partners for Work and ensuring funding is, exists to uh, to stand up uh, pre apprenticeship training so that people were in place yeah. for the construction jobs before the contractors showed up to try to hire for the construction jobs and put people on them because they have to work way, way in advance to make sure that, that these things actually work. Yep. And no, great, great I haven't seen, I haven't heard any sort of data or reporting on how that went for the first block. And I, it would be very interesting to me to have that as we review this proposal, because yep. if it didn't work well in the first in the first block, then either we need to try harder <laughs> or maybe maybe <laughs> maybe we can do something different. Fair enough. Um, can I address that a little bit, Sam? Yeah. Um, I think that, so, you know, we do have a set partnership. That's part of what I um, presented on. Uh, we mainly promote uh, the A. Philip Randolph Institute, uh, the Builders Guild Introduction to the Construction Trades. And we recently added CARP uh, because they actually have a lot of proven results and we're happy to um, add them as a partner. But um, I think if we, go back to the executive management committee slide or just like reference um, what we're talking about. I mean, the EMC is designed to not just um, 
make sure that we follow the CSIP, it's also designed to help us <laughs> do uh, the type of development and make sure that this project is effective. And I just think that um, we, we should, we should, we should have a follow-up uh, because in order to have this discussion and to see what is actual, factual versus what is misinformation. And we've, we've all been subject to misinformation throughout the United States by uh, you know, a certain group of people and championed by one person. And ironically enough, that's happening in the Hill District as well. And it's really unfortunate. Um, so we should go through and um, see. And so like with the EMC, for example, um, the members are, the, the, especially the, the ones that represent the community are also supposed to be helping us. And so that um, is happening partially um, and also blatantly not happening um, by certain members. So it, it's just, um, it's something that we have to deal with and it's a real problem. And, um, you know, obviously <clears throat> Bomani and I, as historic Hill, Hill residents and people who grew up in the Hill District, um, you know, we don't like, we don't really want to uh, be extremely negative you know, with our neighborhood uh, workers, because we know, we know, like we, we've all put in hard work. We have, we have all volunteered literally for like 20 to 25 years. It's so <laughs> sad to say that, but that's a fact. And um, so we respect the work, but in terms of, you know, certain motivations and, and, and it's just it's just unfortunate. That's all I can say. So I, I will say that yes, let let's do a granular yep. let's do a granular follow up, and we can sort out fact versus fiction. Thanks. Yeah, that's yeah Sam. We appreciate we appreciate the question. We really do. Thank you. Reiterate my question, I guess, to maybe make maybe clear what I'm asking. Like, I think it would be helpful to know there's 150 construction workers working right now on the FMB tower. Twenty of them were placed there through the first source center and through green ship green friendship program or two of them were <laughs> or maybe none of them were i don't know but it would be helpful to know how we're doing on that front as we progress through the rest of these but to to add to, to director williamson's quite i mean i think it's understanding the performance now and then you know as sam said like what have we learned and then what are the improvements and how are you going to do, do better on block e right Yep. Like, you know, because it, it is helpful to understand, you know, what the performance has been on FMB, but the matter before us, right, or that will be before us, you know, um, in due time is block E. And so we need mm -hmm. to understand what, you know, what performance we're going to make on block E as well as the updates on the commitments, right? So mm -hmm. um, I think yeah. that's, you know, really the heart of the matter, at least as I understand sort of the way that Sam posed yeah. it. And I think yeah. we're also hearing from the community right? and that that really builds on this idea that a platform is being put in place to expand on as as we go very much it's a great question we have lots of data and and we want to get better you know and Bamani does a great job of pushing me every day to be better here so uh um it's a great question we'll get back to you with real data that that you know, we can share thank you thank you So if I can chime in for a quick second, um, and I don't have as many questions, I do more so a comment, I guess, which is one, and sort of Craig sort of into his remarks saying, and we hope to be back before you for a vote in short order. I'm not sure what your definition of short order is, Craig, but I think it's going to differ than mine. Um, mm -hmm. And I say that because in my personal opinion, we shouldn't even be having this briefing right now. Um, the reality is we opened up the conversation with URA staff going through out, outstanding issues. Um, and if I remember the very opening slide, it had community review on it. It had financials that have not been submitted for review. It had the block E, uh, shoot, what's it called? Final land development plan that they don't have all the information on there. We do not have the MWE workforce plan for review. Um, and there were still questions regarding open urban space. And then there's more that, other members from the public and others presented. In addition to that, we don't act until you go before planning. To the best of my knowledge, you're not on this month's agenda for planning. And so 
given all of that, I don't see how we vote on anything until at least January. And given all the outstanding items, I could sit here and ask questions, but we literally don't have answers to them. And so in my mind, we do the, we do the board briefing a month before we expect to act so that the public also has all the appropriate information for them to vet it, for us to take it in consideration and then act the final month. We don't have that information. We don't have an NWE plan. You haven't gone back before the EORC yet to amend the plan there, right? So the URA doesn't have anything to review. So in my personal opinion, we're at least a month ahead of what we should be doing just based on the information in hand. With that being said, I will ask, and so I, just to be honest, I think our staff have decided to provide this briefing um, in response to an insistent ask from the development team, understandably so, as all developers probably would, but I also think it's unfair to have them do a briefing for us knowing that they're probably gonna to have to do another one a month from now where we can actually get answers to things. With that being said, um, just so I'm clear, Craig, mm -hmm. is the, uh, I can't think what it's called, curtain call, excuse me, is curtain call fully funded? We have identified sufficient private and public and philanthropic funds to advance the project. Okay. Thank you. So I'm, I'm assuming that's not a yes, but I'm going to take it as a yes. It's a yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Also, when you were going through, um, I took a quick snapshot of it. When you were going through the cost to build the garage, um, estimated construction budget, you have it listed as 76.5. But in prior conversations with URA staff, based on what you submitted regarding the finances, I remember it being over well over 100 million. Can you help me understand the difference there? Yeah, I think that there's there's we need to get we need to make sure that the projections that we're sharing with staff, which are very which are very fresh are in total alignment with, with what we're including in a presentation today and how we get from construction to basis of valuation of the parcel and, there, and there's conversions, um, leveling that's occurring there. So we'll, we'll make sure it's really clear what's construction and what the basis of the assessment valuation is for purposes of, of taxes. If I may chime in uh, j just quickly to, I think I can shed some light on where there might be some confusion on these numbers. <clears throat> um, based on the presentation, uh, that 74 million, I believe was uh, for hard costs. Yeah. And then soft costs uh, remain make up the remainder of that uh, figure that gets us into that 100 million ballpark. Correct. If you and, go and to that's, the 19th that's slide, consistent. it says estimated construction budget is 76.5 million. Right. So it's that, not total that's, project. That's yeah, that's not the total, that's just the construction component. Okay, thank you. That helps. Um, how long will it take you to monetize the LERDA? I know we're having a discussion on whether or not it should be, but right. assuming it is per the term sheet requirement, how long will that actually take? Craig, do you want me to take a stab at that? Yeah, you can take that one. Yeah, please. <laughs> so, um, I mean, here's the problem. When we originally did the term sheet, we thought that the URA was going to, uh, or, or a body like that was going to do a tax exempt bond financing for uh, FNB Tower. Um, when when that couldn't occur, and, we, and, and, and they were going to do that, we FNB Bank, who really stepped up to monetize the FNB Tower, uh, Lerda um, had to do it um, as uh, for profit, not tax exempt. By doing that, the interest rate at that time doubled, right? It went from, please don't hold me these numbers, but just directionally two and a half to 4%, something like that. Um, and as a result of that, you know, the amount that we can monetize, you're discounting it back, that interest rate, the higher the interest rate, the less that gets monetized day one. And um, so um, 
that was an issue there. We had a pivot. And quite frankly, we had a get we had a guarantee that that LERDA, um, the monetization, we being the developer and the ownership. So here we are um, a year plus later, and interest rates are at historical highs. And um, you know, basically construction loans are 90% shut down right now. And so if we we are very much trying to monetize the LERDA, but I'd say that nine and a half out of ten of the ten lenders that were out there are gone and won't even do it. Um, you know, we 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 all see what's going on, right, with our mortgages and everything. And so, even if we can find someone to monetize the loan, and FNB Bank will not do it, because um, um, again, I mean, they I think I think they would if it was a, a, a tax exam. But even if they would, the monetization is going to be so much less because of the interest rate. So um, I think one, it's going to be very difficult to find someone, although we are looking under every rock to do it. But two, even if you do, it's going to be um, even less, the monetization amount, the day one monetization amount will be significantly less than it would have been a year ago because of interest rates. Whereas if you were just to receive it year by year, you wouldn't be losing any, you wouldn't be losing a penny. So I, I apologize if I've gone too broad on that, but it's something that, you know, of the thousand things we're working on in this project, it's it's uh, it's one of the big challenges that remains out there. Thank you. Um, I certainly appreciate that. But since, since we're in the public domain, just for public clarity, um, in the term sheet, I, I can appreciate wanting to work with the URA or any other public agency or monetization, excuse me. But just for the public's edification, the term sheet is explicit that it's your obligations, not the public's. But I understand. Um, I did. And by the way, I wasn't trying to suggest as much. I was just trying to give a clarification of where, you know, where things reside right now. I appreciate that. Um, regarding the uh, Zone 2 rescue station, in your presentation, Craig, you made mention of there was a, at one point you all were assuming maybe 1.2 million or so. Now we're assuming we're at three point something million. I forget the number. We're probably at about three and a half million. Okay. And you mentioned applying for dollars to sort of bridge that gap. But how do we how do we sign off on this if if we don't know that gap is actually bridged? Or that because currently when I talk to you, when I work sit with URA staff, right now in your sources and uses and all that sort of stuff, it's still currently just that 1.2 number. It doesn't show that difference being made up. Correct. So I'm assuming by the time we would we would be vote that it would show the difference being made up. Yeah, it'll be included in the total sources of the project. It's what we've got to figure out how to finance, and we're trying to to soften the soften the impact of something that's substantially more exp expensive than what we expected going in. Okay. Um, it was put in the chat. You mentioned in your presentation regarding the New Granada Theater um, that the CDC had come back and asked for all this additional stuff. Um, however, it was mentioned in the chat that the developer had actually asked for a full proposal from the CDC. Is that indeed the case? Um, yeah, I, I, this is a, this is a complicated one. I do think that that the Penguins asked the Hill CDC to give them some idea of what the issues were that were facing the development of the New Granada Theater. So yes, a, a a request was made. We received the request. We acknowledge that request. We haven't responded to the request. Um, we hope that it is not seen as something that is now an obligation in, in addition to what we thought the term programming meant back in 2019 and is therefore an obstacle uh, for support. But yeah, we, we asked, it was responded to, we're evaluating it. Um, there may be some things that we can help with and there may be some things that we cannot. And we owe, we owe the Hill CDC and the sponsors of the New Granada Theater a response. Okay. And then lastly, at least for the moment anyway, um, 
our very first public comment um, was provided by Chavesa, who spoke about the DRP and asking you all to complete that process. Um, part of your presentation was the presentation of other community groups that you've met with. Certainly have no problem there. Meet with everybody in the world if you have the time. Um, it is worth noting that the community group that gave you a letter of support also graded it a C plus development, little concerning. Nonetheless, why have you not completed the DRP process? Let me address the, the C plus. When um, when the when the when the development team met with or presented to the Hill Collaborative and the consensus group, there was some confusion around the housing of the Lower Hill development, and so there was an there was a part of the their scoring that asks about family friendly housing and it was not a part of the presentation because we were focusing on block e which is strictly the parking garage and live nation venue that was a part of the reason why there was a, a c there were also some score tampering with individuals who came in and just wrote a bunch of zeros um, from a particular organization. And so that's why there was um, a, a downgraded, but understand uh, that the, the C was, was weighted as a, I think 2.8 and 2.9. If you take away the confusion around the housing not being a part of what was presented, scores would have been higher. Also, the tampering would have been uh, a reason that the numbers would have gone up. And this is why okay. they, they also, I'm sorry, uh, Councilman, this is also why they proceeded to follow up after a board meeting to provide a letter of support both by the Hill Collaborative and also the consensus group. On the DRP, the Hill CDC's development review panel has uh, been the kind of core uh, process by which development projects have come forth and evaluated the project. And the change of focus from the 2019 score of 89 to uh, a lesser grade um, with uh, additional asks um, became a bit complex and even in some ways um, uh, confrontational. And so we said we're not going to disengage from the Hill, DC, Hill CDC or the development review process, but we'll continue to uh, provide updates, we'll continue to communicate, and uh, we'd like to get back to the table to talk about um, all of those outstanding issues. We certainly most, uh, we, we plan to do so. We're still okay. at the what, what I will, so one, I appreciate your response regarding the C plus score. Um, I can certainly appreciate the removing of housing um, and what that would do to it. Um, I don't want to cast aspersions on anyone and, and suggest that there was tampering. I was certainly in the meeting. I didn't see that, but so I don't want to do that here. Um, related, just related to the DRP, because a number of members of the DRP, um, and just in fairness to them, have asked me to ask you to please finish the process. Um, just for clarity, it's not the CDC's DRP, although the CDC does staff it for clarity, um, but it's a, I forget the number, I apologize, but six or seven community organizations that make up the DRP. And they would like for you all to come back to the table. Um, if, if any of them are on this call and we have public comment at the end, feel free to speak for yourself. But they did ask me specifically to have you all complete the DRP process. And the reason why they wanted you to resubmit, according to what they've told me, is that your development, even according to our own slides at the beginning of this presentation, has significantly changed um, from what it was, from what they approved then to what it is now. So just for clarity on that. 
Uh, with that, I don't think I have any more questions at the moment. I'll open up to my other board members. Okay, Councilman, can I just respond to one thing? Councilman Lavelle, uh, I mean, really the only thing that uh, we believe of substance that has changed in the last three years or however long it's been through this pandemic is um, I personally didn't feel comfortable building a music venue <clears throat> that 30, 60 nights a year was gonna have an outdoor venue um, with music going into our, our neighborhood. It just didn't seem like that was the appropriate thing to do to our neighbors, not the right thing to do. And so essentially we've removed the outdoor component to the to the music venue, but otherwise like pretty much the same, you know, uh, pretty much the same project that we're doing. And I think when we prevented, presented before we got a passing grade, we only made it better. Um, and I don't think there were follow-up questions at that time um so we just would be presenting the same thing uh you know uh, which we think is a far superior product for the community and more respectful of the community yeah i think it's worth clarifying that the materials that the drp did receive were consistent with the final land development plan and the early design information that was being circulated so if we had reapplied it would be exact same material that they already had had and reviewed in july so we there's so not a there's not like a gap between 2019 and 2022. They were they were receiving this spring and through the summer the same materials that were being distributed and presented with the with the changes and the evolution of the project. I'm gonna push back some um, because it, it it's no secret that I'm not a huge fan of parking garages. I think most people aren't, but they're a necessary evil. So I get it. Neither way. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I get it. Um, we don't want that. We don't want one. But in 2019, we were discussing a garage that was going to be underground, and we were discussing a menu, a music venue that was going to be on top of it that would potentially be able to be opened up. The fact that we're now discussing a, a larger um, parking facility above ground. Um, which obviously, and I, I, I will give you credit where credit is deserved. You've done a lot of work to try to pretty it up, right? So it's not like the horrible casino garage. Um, so I give you credit there. But those two things alone make it significantly different. I mean, if we just put up the picture from the beginning of this presentation that show what we preliminary approved to what's being asked of now, that is significantly different, in my opinion. Unfortunately, I think the narrative that's being used is um, making it sound like it's more different than it really is. I think we're going from like low 800 to 900 uh, spaces, which if that's a big deal, we won't do. I mean, if you know, you come back and say, hey, we want it to be the same size, we're happy to do it. This isn't, it's just, it's just the way the floor plates, you know, the floor plates work. And I think, Craig, maybe you might remember, but we might be one floor less but maybe we're still we're still on three floors. We're below ground um, on the back and the side, but maybe in the front we were one floor deeper below. But it's not like we've, by any imagination, lifted the the, the project up. What we've done is we've just taken yeah. a live I mean, nation which was on top, and we've just put them separate so that it can actually get you know so that it can actually get built because we now don't need couldn't do that before because of the outdoor venue. We removed the outdoor venue. Yeah. The, the scale that it presents at the street is fairly consistent. Um, and we have to work within the minimums. Um, the, the, the increase in size is important to make sure that we only have to build one garage on this site and not do this again. Um, but. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question, um, and I, I know that we talked a little bit about this, we skirted around a little bit, but I do want to dig into the housing piece of this. I think for me um, and for many others uh, on the call here uh, and for folks who are listening, um, without a clear idea, timeline on how housing will be brought online, how we're ensuring people can stay in their homes uh, is incredibly concerning. Like that's ultimately how we all got here, right, is, is entertainment venues uh, in residential neighborhoods without any affordable housing strategy. So if we could talk 
a little bit more today or in the future about um, you know, when housing is coming online, what we're doing to uh, support and secure housing um, and affordable housing in the upcoming years, I would appreciate it. Thank you for that question. Um, a lot of anticipation has been sitting around the idea of housing coming online. And um, it's partly because um, we've not provided an update on the previous team of which I was a part of, Intergen Real Estate Group. Um, since 2018, there was um, a real challenge and certainly through the pandemic to finance the, uh, the housing component. And so um, in January of this year, the Penguins terminated the contract with Intergen Real Estate Group. And so since then, uh, the Lower Hill Development Team has been attempting to regroup because of the, right, the development of Parcel G with the First National Bank Financial Center. And then now the focus on Block E, the parking garage and Live Nation venue. It's a massive undertaking and uh, while we intend to transition into making sure that we bring housing online, um, these two projects uh, came um, at a time that were before the, uh, the housing. And as soon as we are able to regroup, we'll come back before the community and the greater, um, the greater Hilders community and then also the city to present a, plan, a path forward. And I appreciate that. I just think that for me personally, uh, feeling secure in some of the other agreements and uh, uh, pieces of this that need to move forward, having a clearer idea of what the housing will look like, um, what the housing process will look like. I know you need to bring a new developer on, but I think that while they are two separate pieces of what we're talking about, um, frankly, trust and buying in the process for me is hinged upon on, on uh, the housing piece of this. Yeah, we, we share the same, we, we share the same concerns. And, and so we, we're most certainly committed to getting back to you in the near future. Related to that, to the housing piece of it, I know we're not talking about um, the amendment to the PLDP, but, but are, are, does, does anything in the changes to the PLDP speak to um, the housing, you know, where it's kind of um, envisioned on the site, is it still in the same places um, or any other sort of related commitments there? There, the, um, Kyle, there's, there's no change to the configuration of the sub-districts, which have um, established uses and not permitted uses. So housing can still occur where it was intended to occur. Um, when we share illustrative plans, uh, we still show housing on block A, B, and C primarily. Um, and that the ability to do that and the intent to do that is not affected by the PLDP amendment. Um, I guess just to return quickly to, to some of the back and forth on, you know, maybe to kind of crosswalk some of the questions the councilman was raising. Um, I mean, I think the, as I hear it, the, the changes on, you know, that you've presented as it relates to the design, it's less a question of, certainly it's similarly programmatically. I think the questions more are around the, the changes to the design itself, right? And, and the, the form and sort of the massing and then more over the street level interaction, right? As I kind of hear in, in, in the comments that, you know, were expressed today as well as the conversation now. Um, so, you know, those are sort of different, right? And, and I think the programmatically certainly it's the same, but, you know, those aspects of it, you know, are different. And I think that's what okay. at least I hear coming through from the comments that have been made. Um, I'm looking through the chat. There's a couple questions that, that folks have brought up. Um, 
on the, I, we, we talked some on the construction job side of things, I think specific to the um, permanent jobs on block E. Have there been conversations with Live Nation um, related to, you know, commitments similar to the contract, the construction contractors are making, right? Like, you know, similar commitments around hiring to underscore Sam's earlier points, um, you know, from the neighborhood, et cetera, as well as some of the um, comments we heard, you know, from the public at the, at the beginning of the briefing. Regarding uh, the, our, our commitment to both MWVE and workforce, um, we're at our early stages. We're in the early stages of pre-development. And so that includes our, uh, this is about our conversations with architectural firms and our MEP uh, plans. And so that's where we are right now. We've not selected a CM and uh, we do plan to advance the conversation once we've done so. And we can update our uh, workforce and MWBE a path forward once we um, have that in place. Thanks, uh, Bomani. I, I guess specific to the, the permanent jobs that'll be on site though, ha have there been conversations with the operator around making, you know, signing, you know, those commitments or making similar commitments as? Yeah, I, this, is a, this, is a good, this is a good question. Uh, I don't think we have a, a, an answer for you right now, but it's a good question and we'll, we'll follow up. Thank you. I had another question. Um, Back to, back to housing. Um, I know that we've talked uh, today about uh, you all feeling like this isn't uh, as big of a change from 2019 to what we're seeing. I'm sorry, if, if you don't mind, please excuse me for the interruption. If you don't mind, can you move closer? Because I'm- Yeah, no worries. This is the now. difficulty of sharing a desk here. But um, <laughs> I was saying, you know, back to, back to housing, when we were talking about uh, you all not feeling like there is a massive difference between what was presented in 2019 and, and, and now, um, and obviously understanding that COVID has changed circumstances for what feels appropriate, what is feasible, uh, and frankly, what's fundable for this project. Um, again, considering COVID has made it very difficult for residents, for tenants, uh, especially in the neighborhoods that we're looking at for um, for this project, uh, when it comes to housing, are we at all considering how we can make this uh, more, uh, how, how we can make some of our housing more affordable? I know for uh, within the CSIP, there are designated levels of affordability that we need to hit. Uh, but again, considering uh, COVID has made, uh, you know, you all switch some of your plans on what you're presenting. Um, can that go both ways? And can we explore uh, ways that uh, we can make some of our housing options more affordable and deeper levels of affordability outside of what's already set uh, within the CSIP. Uh, I'll, I'll reiterate um, that we're, we're not there yet, but where we can stand solid is that the CSIP calls for 20% 20, 20 affordable housing, and we don't plan to deviate away from that. But we're just not there with regard to the um, the other questions that you're, you're asking. But we, we promise to get back Sorry, to you with with, um, with with greater detail when, when, when they're when we're there yeah when we get there I would like to see uh, some type of exploration on what that could look like um, and if you're willing to like reasonably explore it thank you we have other questions from Anyone on the board? Hi, uh, it's Sam. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Sam. Okay, so I just wanted to flag and follow up to, to your point about the Live Nation jobs that really that, that conversation should include not just the sort of job placement, first source hiring and job training commitments that were made, but also the job quality commitments that were made originally way back in 2008 as part of the One Hill CBA, but then also reiterated by PAR in 2020. Because they are coming into a situation where there, there have already been commitments made around the, the actual wage and benefit standards of those end use jobs. Correct. Thanks. 
I, I wanted to acknowledge what Daniel uh, pointed out. This, this is a briefing that is maybe premature, may not exactly gonna fall into the expectations of 30 days. We do know that there's a lot of processes um, and, and elements that are at play right now. We wanted to have this conversation. We asked for this conversation and we're very, very appreciative of the work that staff does in preparing for this and the engagement that we have with board. This is not, um, that's not taken lightly. Um, and we will continue to work at, at full strength, at full effort to answer and respond to and come back when it's right. We do know there are, there are open issues. We certainly understand we have to achieve planning commission approval before uh, final approval as a major threshold. Yeah, thanks, Craig. I, I was I was going to go there too. Um, you know, I, I appreciate sort of the desire, you know, from the team to have um, an update on on you know where you stand with things. You know, not just for the board's benefit, but you know for the public's. Um, but you know, I would underscore you know what the council member said um, earlier in terms of you know really you know our duty right and and um, the how important this site is to the city. And I, I know you all. Have an understanding and appreciation for that um but you know in terms of what we're briefed on you know we want to make sure that the public then has time to digest that so that what we vote on is substantively similar um you know recognizing that that you know you're making progress you're working on things but um you know when you come back we want to make sure that um we we're, we're damn close right on a lot of these um where your commitments are you know where things stand those conversations that need to happen, you know, with, with community, um, you know, et cetera, so that um, what's briefed on and then what we vote on are, you know, close, close to one another in, you know, substantive ways, recognizing that, you know, things can change sort of on the edges, but I think, you know, the substantive items that um, we've spoken on today, as well as that staff, you know, mentioned, um, and you mentioned during the briefing, um, that are in progress that, you know, we make that progress um, before the next time you come to the board, so. Unless there are any other comments or questions from the board, I will entertain a motion to adjourn our meeting. Thank you all. Thank you all for your time. Thank you everyone, appreciate it. Thank you. We have a motion to adjourn. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Do we have a second? Enthusiastically second. <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.